few years ago, there was a television show that came on, and if I'm not mistaken, there were probably more than one. There were adaptations of it for different networks and such, but it dealt with reconciliation. You might remember it. They, the people who were trying to find long lost relatives, maybe a child had been given up for adoption at birth and that child was trying to find the birth mother, birth parents. Maybe it was the birth parents trying to find the child. Maybe it was siblings trying to find one another. But if you remember that show, it was very emotional. And they tried to make it very emotional. They showed what joy there was when families were reconciled, brought back together. And the cameras would always be there to be focused on when the two came together and the joy that would be there. It's almost inexpressible. But for us, we have a greater reconciliation that needs to take place. We have this great reconciliation that needs to take place with our God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because we have to answer to them. Something has happened in the past, in our past, for the most of us as we've reached an age of accountability, that we've walked away from our God. And in many ways, it's like the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. You know, that prodigal son, he was there with his father, with his older brother. He was at home. He was on the, the ranch, the farm, the plantation, whatever you want to call it. Things were really good, but he didn't think it was good. The grass seemed to be greener over on the other side. There's more fun out there. And he didn't like the rules that were in his father's house. He didn't want to be held back. He wanted to explore. He wanted to go out and do what he wanted to do. So he broke that relationship with his father and with his older brother to go out and to live righteously, to live for pleasure. And he went out and he ate and he drank and he made merry. And pretty soon, his money was gone. And he went back to his father. And he found out what the joy of the reconciliation truly was. And that's the picture that God gives us in his word of our being reconciled to our God. Because our sins, our decisions to turn away from God, our decision to walk away from Him and, and do things on our own get us into such deep trouble. Sin takes over our lives. The lust drives us that way. That's what we're made of. That, that's the human nature, really. It, it is to want to think that we are in control of everything, no matter how far astray we get. But it took a long time for this young man in, in Luke chapter 15 to find out that the reconciliation with the Father is greater than anything that this world could offer us. And it's a real reconciliation. It's a joy that takes place beyond this world. Look at that. Luke chapter 15, verse 10. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And why is that? Because that alienation has been taken away. The alienation. Now, what is an alienation? You know, Paul talks about alienation. But what is alienation from God and what causes it there from verse 21? Well, alienation means estrangement. It's a separation that really comes about because of a hostile environment. Now, we hear about it lots of times in, in the family sense that when a husband and wife don't get along, they might separate. And when they do, they're alienated. They are estranged from one another. You take away that estrangement, you know, well, they're familiar. They know one another. They understand one another. But see, emotionally, there becomes a detachment there. And the first place where we really become uh, detached from God, if that's the proper word, I'm trying to think, detached from 
Is that better, John? Detached from God? Separated, alienated, estranged from God is the emotional sense. Because we begin to love things in this world more than we love Him who is outside of this world and over everything. So a spiritual alien is one who has no spiritual privileges in the kingdom of God. Talked before about Father blessings and Creator blessings. We all share in Creator blessings. We, we breathe the same air. We receive the same rain. That, that Jesus said the rain falls on the just and the unjust. It, it just happens. That's Creator blessings. But the Father blessings, the spiritual blessings, are the forgiveness of sin, the uh, the joy and the peace and the love and all those things that develop out of that relationship with God are things that only can come to us because we're not separated from God. We're not estranged from Him. So as spiritual aliens, we can't expect God to forgive us our sins until we come back to God, until we make that reconciliation. And God, well, we make the reconciliation to God. We've got to take those steps. But until we do, we lack the protection from the power of sin that stands against us, that condemns us, that would send us to a devil's hell for eternity. Think of what God has done to, to begin this reconciliation and, and give us this power over sin. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. According to the riches of His grace, we have redemption through His blood. We have this reconciliation because of Christ's shed blood upon the cross. And 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sins. It's a continual action. See, in two parts. In two parts. One in that initial part to bring a reconciliation toward God. And secondly then, that even as Christians, when we sin, if we will confess our sins and repent of those sins, His blood will still take it away. It's when we refuse to confess those sins and then we refuse to repent of those sins that the protection is gone and we stand estranged from God once again. Alienation or estrangement in the political sense results from foreign allegiances. Now you consider that for a moment. You know, we're going through things in our country about uh, uh, immigration policy. And, you know, we, we're going to naturalize and we're going to make citizens of all these people who came here illegally. And it doesn't matter where you stand on that. That's not what my point is in this. But here, to become a citizen, an alien has to give up all allegiance to his former country. Remember after, well, you read the history books, some of you might recall, after World War II, there were a lot of people who came here from Japan, from Germany, from Eastern Europe that were under the Nazis. They, they came here. And when they came here and they became citizens, they held up their hand and they said, I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the Constitution. And I, I, I pledge to defend it from... Like, I don't know if they do that or not. But we get the point, don't we? You have to say, I'm no longer from that country. I'm in this new country. I belong to this country. And that's where my allegiance lies. Spiritually, we have to give up our allegiance to Satan and to the world and to sin. And that's what verse 21 is telling us. Jesus put it this way in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. Jesus said, you cannot serve God and mammon. Plain and simple. See, there's no gray area within that. And if we serve Satan, 
then we're not serving God. We need to be reconciled if we get in that condition. So Christ, Christ who is both God and man, has come to this world to reconcile alien sinners to God. He did not come here to reconcile God to us. No. God's not the one who walked away. God's not the one who caused the alienation. God is not the one who caused the estrangement. It was us when we chose to sin that we walked away from God. And God saw that. God said, that's not what I want. God said, I'll make a way for them to come back. And it was through His Son, Jesus Christ. Man must be reconciled to God, not the other way around. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That's what we do. We're supposed to be going out here reconciling lost people to God. That's our purpose here on this earth. That is, verse 19, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and as has committed to us that word of reconciliation. But you go back, that not imputing the trespasses, think what we were talking about this morning in Bible class about the Lamb's book of life. And in Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, See, if your name's written in the Lamb's book of life, if you will remain faithful until death, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, then He will not blot your name out of the book of life. And see, that imputing, that's like computing. They're accounting terms. So, as Christians, our name is written in the Lamb's book of life into heaven, and if we will remain faithful to Him, then He won't blot our name out. We've got to get our name in there after we have sinned against Him. And Jesus is the one who provides that means for us. For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, you can become a child of God by obeying the Gospel. Very simple. And when you obey the Gospel, then you are reconciled. But note the purpose of Christ's love and coming and dying upon the cross. John chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. What's He saying? I'll reconcile all men to me. Now we don't understand that as being all in the sense that everybody who's ever lived is going to be reconciled. No, that's not the case. But all that will recognize Him as the Christ. All who believe that He is the Christ. All who will obey the Gospel. He is that means of reconciliation. Neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. God only has one plan. Ephesians chapter 4. There's one plan. There's one Gospel that we need to believe and obey so that we can be reconciled to God. Reconcili reconciliation takes place in one body. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 16, and you can go to Ephesians chapter 4, and that He might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. What's that enmity? Well, that's that estrangement. That's that hostile environment that's between the two. And, and Jesus, or, I'm sorry, Paul here in Ephesians particularly is talking about Jews and Gentiles. How that God took the Jews who were under the law of Moses and took Gentiles who were supposed to be under the patriarchal system, but He takes them both and puts them together in one body. 
That one body is his body. It's his spiritual body, the church. And he brings us together in one. He reconciles us in the church. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. He put all things under his feet. God put all things under Jesus' feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. What a wonderful thing. We're reconciled in one body. There's not a group over there and a group over there and a group over there. When it comes to being the Lord's people, when it comes to being reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, we're in one body. See? And in the book of Acts, chapter 2, they who gladly received the word were baptized and they were added to the church. That one church. Jesus Church. When an alien sinner submits himself to the gospel plan of salvation, he ceases to be an alien sinner, and Christ takes his place among the children of God. Christ takes his place where he's supposed to be as head of the body, as head of the church, but only when we're reconciled to God through him. Now God's divine purpose behind reconciliation is man's greatest good and highest happiness. Somebody said, well, well, I think God wants me to be happy. God wants you to be deliriously happy. God wants you to be wonderfully happy. God wants you to be eternally happy. But the problem is people who say that usually twist it around to the point where it's they want some sin that makes them happy to be recognized as what God would want them to do. And that can never be. Because sin cannot make us happy other than for a moment. Think about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. There they were. They were happy and free and God would come and walk with them and talk with them. God was teaching them. And the moment they sinned, oh, that fruit probably tasted really good for a moment. But you think about the, the Israelites who wanted meat and wanted meat there in the wilderness, and they got the meat, and as they ate it, it just came rotten in their mouths. And it just tasted. And I can imagine that with Adam and Eve, that as soon as they ate of it, there was something that was distasteful because immediately they were, they knew that they were guilty and they were ashamed of what they had done. So yes, yeah, sin, sin might be pleasing right at the moment, but it brings such terrible consequences. Shame and guilt and death to the individual. God's divine purpose behind reconciliation, bringing man back into a right relationship with him is man's greatest good and highest happiness. And this consists in the following. There from uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 22, moral purity. Moral purity. What is God doing when He's reconciling us back to Him because of our faith in Jesus Christ, because of our obedience to the Gospel? He's presenting us holy. God said, what, what God declares holy, let no man call unclean. And right there's the division between the church and the world because the world looks at us and says, you're, you're no good. You're, you're silly for believing in God. You're silly for attending church services. You're, you're silly for praying to God. All those things are just silliness, they say. They have no concept of the holy and that which is separated and sanctified for God's use. But God presents us. He wants to present us holy. Jesus wants to present us as a chaste 
bride on judgment day so his father can say, come on into the kingdom. Because you're holy. There's no sin there. It's been covered by the blood of Christ. This is in regard to the inner man. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If there's impurity in the heart, if, sin, if, if we want sin, if we desire sin, if we lust after sinful things, and see, our hearts are not going to be pure. And we're not going to see God on judgment day. We've got to work on that. The second thing is in the last part of verse 22, Colossians chapter 1, personal righteousness. He's going to present us blameless. Blameless. Well, how can He present us blameless? We've sinned. But He takes the sin away. He erases it from the ledger. See? It's not held against us anymore. Yes, we're sinners. Let's never forget that we are sinners. And that we are in need of a Savior. That will help to keep us humble. When we think we've done enough that, that, that we don't have to do anymore, we don't have to learn anymore, we don't have to serve anymore, we don't have to worship anymore, because we got that place in heaven, then Satan's got us. We don't have hate heaven, Satan's got us. But this is in regard to outward life, to be blameless in outward life. Romans chapter 6 and verse 12, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. Don't let it have control. And that's the important thing. See, put it together with what John is saying, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, not only that, but all of chapter 1 and, and good part of the first part of chapter 2, is that we're going to sin. As Christians, we will still sin, but don't let sin reign over you. Do what's necessary to have that taken away, to cover it up with the blood of Christ, get rid of it, confess it, repent it. Do what's necessary. So that, that reconciliation with God is not taken away. And our names be blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. There's freedom from censure. The last, real last part of verse 22. Okay? There are three things there in verse 22. And the last one is that we would be above reproach. And that's freedom from censure. Listen, as Christians, there are going to be people out here that are going to accuse us of all kinds of stuff. <clears throat> if it's true, then we need to do something about it, don't we? If it's not true, it doesn't matter. Why does it matter? Because it doesn't matter what people say about us. What matters is what God says about us. So we will be above reproach. And this is regard, in regard to character of life. If God does not condemn you, then you stand above reproach. And they can say all oh, manner of evil against you falsely for the name of Christ, and it won't make any difference. got something we need to do about it. So we reconcile. We're reconciled to God. We're brought back into a right relationship with God, but that's not the end of it. We've got to continue to go on. We've got to continue to remain reconciled to God. You know, you got a checkbook and hopefully at the end of every month you take your bank statement and your checkbook and you're reconciled. They got to come all out with the same number. Both of them got to be the same number at the end of the month. Because if they're not, there's a problem. There's a problem that's got to be taken care of. Eventually, you're going to get overdrawn. You're going to get all these statements saying, you owe another $30, or you owe this, you owe that. You had a late fee, and you have an overdraft charge. And you, you don't want that in your checkbook, do you? You pay attention to that checkbook. You, well, some people do. <laughs> but you do it. Because it's important to you. And see, when our God becomes as important to us as our checkbook is, and hopefully more important, then 
we'll take care of those spiritual things also. How important is it? I mean, how important could it be, right? I mean, it's just a little sin. It's just a little cantankerousness. It's just a little rebellion against God. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. The love of God is demonstrated toward us in that while we were yet enemies, sinners, Christ died for us. Let's take this as the work as God does. Because God felt the important to reconcile man to himself. That he sent his only begotten son to die that humiliating death upon the cross so that we could, can, can, can be reconciled to him. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 23. We'll be reconciled. We'll be reconciled if conditional term. Indeed, you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven. Where are you at this morning? Have you been reconciled to God if you obeyed the gospel? If you been baptized for the remission of sins to bring you back into the right relationship with God? Maybe you've done that in the past, but you've walked away. You haven't been grounded. You haven't been steadfast. You've just done whatever you wanted to do. Come back. Be reconciled to God. It's eternally important. 